And there's an intimation of hope. And we miss it because the calendar is different. But here in verse seven and verse 13 of chapter three, it gives us some indications of the timing. Haman's decree for the murder of God's people, it is sent forth on the eve of Passover. Which goes all the way back to Exodus 12. Different nation, it's not Persia, it's Egypt. Different ruler, it's not Xerxes, it's Pharaoh. But the same thing, there is one who is worshiped like a God, ruling over God's people and abusing them. And the problem is that God's people are in exile away from home on both accounts because of their own sin and the discipline of a holy and righteous God. And so they need to deal with their sin that they could be delivered from their slavery, their bondage, their exile. And so the decree is given that death is coming to every home with one exception, those homes that acknowledge their sin and repent of it. And sometimes faith is an inward conviction and sometimes it's an outward action. We know what you believe by how you behave. And they take, based upon God's commands, beginning in Exodus 12, a lamb without spot or blemish, showing sinless. They confess their sins, so there's imputation or reckoning so that their sins go to the animal and now it becomes a substitute. And then they take the animal and they slaughter it so that the animal dies and the blood is shed because the wage for sin is death and the animal dies as the substitute. And then in faith, as a demonstration of their faith, they take the blood of the animal and they cover the doorpost to their home, showing outwardly and publicly, unlike Mordecai and Esther, who wanna have a private faith, this is a public faith, that we worship the God of the Bible, that we're sinners, that we deserve death, hell, and the wrath of God. And there is a substitute that has shed its blood, paid its life without spot or blemish, a lamb for us. And then that night, death comes to the nation And it brings death to the firstborn son in every home with one exception, those homes who are literally covered by the blood of the lamb in faith and repentance. And the decree from Haman is on the eve of Passover. He's not the first one to to try and destroy God's people. And as God delivered them from Egypt, he will deliver them from Persia many years later. And this is all leaning toward Jesus. The whole Bible's one story with one hero. Jesus comes. Like Mordecai and Esther working together as cousins, Jesus worked with his cousin, John the Baptizer. And when John the Baptizer sees his cousin Jesus coming, here's the truth. Jesus is a king seated on a throne like Xerxes. And he does something that Xerxes never does. He gets off his throne and he comes into human history and he humbles himself to not just see numbers, but faces. And he loves people and he serves people and he knows people and God becomes a man. And John looks at Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world the fulfillment of Passover. This is what Paul says. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He says, Paul Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb has been slain. Jesus is our Passover. And what happens is Jesus comes, our great king, the greater Xerxes with the greater kingdom, the kingdom of God. And like Mordecai to Haman, we don't bow down to him. And he doesn't act like Haman. He doesn't get proud and arrogant. And he doesn't have angry, vengeful wrath against us. He loves us and he serves us. And like the two men that we read of in Esther 2 and 3, we plot the king's murder. We conspire to murder the king of kings. And unlike Xerxes, he doesn't have us crucified he allows us to crucify him. And our humble, loving, gracious servant king who deals with faces and not just numbers looks people in the eye who have plotted his demise and says, Father, forgive them. Jesus forgives all the sins. Jesus works out all the mistakes. And Jesus takes the worst tragedy and makes it into the greatest glory. 
And this whole book is about him.